Jenny Stepanek is up next right after these stories. The Catholic Church has consecrated virgins, women who have pledged lifelong virginity as brides of Christ, are taking issue with a new Vatican document. It says consecrated virgins no longer need to be virgins. The Vatican's new instruction on consecrated virginity, Ecclesiae Sponsae Imago, was published and approved by Pope Francis at the request of bishops who were reporting a boom in the number of women being called to this vocation. There was a section in the 39-page document that drew the ire of those already consecrated virgins. It appears to suggest that lifelong virginity is no longer a requirement for consecration. It reads, the call to give witness to the church's virginal, spousal, and fruitful love for Christ is not reducible to the symbol of physical integrity. Thus, to have kept her body in perfect continence or to have practiced the virtue of chastity in an exemplary way, while of great importance with regard to the discernment, are not essential prerequisites in the absence of which admittance to consecration is not possible. The U.S. Association of Consecrated Virgins said the document was deeply disappointing and that it is shocking to hear from Mother Church that physical virginity may no longer be considered an essential prerequisite for consecration to a life of virginity. There are approximately 5,000 consecrated virgins in at least 42 countries. Finally tonight, she is the mother of Maddie Stepanek, the inspiring young poet, peace advocate, and philosopher. In the years since Maddie's death, Jenny Stepanek has carried on his message in an extraordinary way. In part two of our interview, we continued our discussion of Maddie's message of peace and the current state of his cause for sainthood. Here's more of my exclusive interview with Dr. Jenny Stepanek. A cause has been started for his sainthood, um, of which I am a part in full disclosure. Um, give me a sense, a part of that process is heroic virtue and virtue well lived. I know Maddie had a devotion to Andre Bisset. Tell me about, he received a relic yes. from Andre yes. Bisset, which was very important to him yes. at a um, particular time. In 2001, um, Maddie almost died. Um, he slipped into several comas, um, and in fact, the doctor said he would not survive more than a few days, possibly a few weeks if he was lucky. Uh, his body literally was dying around his spirit. Um, one of the big problems was his trachea was eroding, just falling apart, and he was bleeding constantly he was bleeding from his fingers, his lips, his trachea, his feet. Um, and somebody brought him a relic from André Bisset. And at the time, André Bisset was beatified, but not canonized. And um, Maddie prayed for several weeks with this relic sitting on his hospital tray. And then he asked to go home. And the doctors disagreed with him going home. Um, they said, you're, you're going to die, and if you go home, you're going to die in agony. If you stay here, we can at least comfort you and give you pain medicine for those final minutes. Mm -hmm. And he said, I have to live until the moment I die. And if I stay here, I'm dying until the moment I die. He said, I still have purpose. I still have a message. I cannot finish my mission, my ministry in the hospital. And he said, I think I've got more time. Um, and he was just absolutely convinced. How so, old was he at this point? Um, he was 10 when he began it. He went home just a, about a week or two after he turned 11. Mm. And on the day that they said he could go home, they were sending him home in an ambulance because they really didn't think he would survive the trip home. But it was his wish to be at home and they were respecting his, his wish. He picked up the relic of Andre Bisset mm. and he said out loud, um, Brother Andre, you need a miracle to become a saint, and I need a miracle to fulfill my purpose from God. Let's work together. Mm. And he touched the relic to his trachea, and then he closed his eyes and said a silent prayer. Um, I don't, he never talked to me about what he said, and after a minute he put the relic down, and the bleeding stopped, like stopped. Mm. And he said, okay, I'm ready to go home. 
And I looked and I went and got the doctors and I said, the bleeding stopped. And the doctors were concerned. They said, when the bleeding stops, what's likely gonna happen is it's gonna scab and the first time he coughs, it's gonna just perforate the entire um, trachea and he's going to suffocate. Yes. And they said, do you still wanna take him home? Because this is what we've been waiting for. Um, and I talked to Maddie and he said, no, 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 I've gotten a miracle. And I said, what if you're wrong? <laughs> what if this is scabbing? And, and he said, no, I know I've got an miracle. I'm ready to go home and mm -hmm. fulfill my purpose. And this is before Oprah? Before, oh, the, before all that, The yes. poetry before all yep. of that. Yes. Um, and, but he had already written most yeah. of the poetry. Right. Um, the whole Oprah, I'd like to go back yeah. to that if that's okay. Yeah, but, um, let's talk about but, that because a lot of people that know him after. from, and right. they think, well, he was Oprah's yeah. most frequent guest. Right. And that's what they know him from. Right, but there's a whole different story. But what happened was he did get a miracle. He lived another three years before that bleeding started back up and he died. Um, and in that three years is when everybody learned about him. Um, but we were shocked when he went home and literally the bleeding stopped and the doctors could not explain it. And then he believes that he got another miracle um, a few months later, he had another open sore that needed surgery. And um, uh, actually, <laughs> speaking of Oprah, Oprah had asked him what he wanted for Christmas, and he said prayer. Huh. And so she got worldwide prayer for him. I remember and that. the sore on the back of his head that had been there for almost a year, that was getting to a life-threatening point, just closed up. They could not explain it. On the 30th day of prayer, she had 30 days of prayer on day 30, the sore closed up and mm -hmm. never opened again. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, he received a miracle and he kept that relic on his wheelchair until the day he died. Um, I now have the relic next to my bed um, in his honor. You have recently found a speech that Maddie wrote yes. where he lays out the building blocks of peace and he talks particularly about pro-life, being pro-life. What did he say in that talk? Um, he was invited to be a keynote speaker at a youth rally in Southern Maryland. He was 11 years old and I was just telling somebody about this and I said I have some of his notes and I pulled it up and it actually is a well written out. He must have gone back and journaled about it later. But I was amazed as I was just skimming through it and he's talking about the building blocks of life and he breaks down hope and peace and talks about building blocks of hope and one of them is um, courage and fortitude and building blocks of peace. One of the biggest building blocks of peace is forgiveness. He said we must forgive other people. We must, we must embrace kindness. Um, so he talks a lot about courage, forgiveness and being rooted in faith and he talks about people argue about right to life, right to um, pro-life, pro-choice, and he said, really, life is a gift, it's not a choice. Um, so that was, he, he said, it's, it's almost an oxymoron that, that we're, we're talking about life, not a choice. Mm -hmm. He knew many times, he had an intuition about what was about to happen. Um, tell me about the situation when he was four years old and he's playing in the yard. Yeah, um, Maddie often knew what was going to happen in the next moment or a year later sometimes. Um, and I, one time when he was four, he and a little friend were playing in our backyard um, and we lived on a block where the backyards were shared and so the mom of this little girl he's playing with, she's in her kitchen window, I'm in my kitchen window um, and we're both looking out and we both happen to see Maddie jump up and literally start dragging this little girl, like dragging her, dragging her, pulling her, dragging her, and he's screaming something at the top of his lungs. And, um, and it looks like he's being mean, and, and Maddie was not a mean child. Maddie right. was one of the kindest kids you're ever gonna meet. And so the other mother and I both go running out, you know, it's like, what are you doing? Stop that now. And we hear Maddie saying, move, move. God said move. And he's screaming and he's grabbing this little girl and he gets her to the other side of the yard and, and he's just frantic. And then all of a sudden we hear this 
loud cracking noise. It's a beautiful sunny day. There's no wind, there's nothing. There's been no storm for weeks. Um, we hear this ear splitting cracking noise and then we hear bang, 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 thud. And we look and right where they had just been sitting, there's the whole top half of the tree has fallen down into the earth and made this eight inch indentation right where they were sitting. And the other mother said, Maddie, <laughs> how did you know? Did you hear something? And he said, no, God said, move. Hmm. That was that. And so he moved. <laughs> um, he did that throughout his life, by the way. Yes, he did. God he said, moved. move, and he God went. Said, move. If God said something, <laughs> Maddie right. listened. Um, and, and there's many instances. There's many things that Maddie just knew something that was going to happen or knew the source of something that had occurred, Maddie knew his own life. He, he told me on July 16th, and the reason I know the date, it was the day before his 10th mm -hmm. birthday. On the last day, he was nine, July 16th, 2000. He said, March 30th is a dark day for me. Mm -hmm. And I said, March 30th, that's random. Yeah. And he said, no, it's not random. God told me March 30th is a dark day for me. Um, and we're at the beach when he says this. I mean, we're, we're playing, yeah. we're having fun. There's, time, there's yeah. no reason for me to think March 30th is gonna be a dark day. Mm. Um, but he said, I'm not sure I survived March 30th. Um, something dreadful is gonna happen and it's dark. It's very, very dark. And I'm afraid I'm not gonna finish my purpose. I'm afraid that's the end of my life. Mm. Um, and as it turns out, um, he got very, very sick in March and was very delirious in the days leading up to March 30th. Um, his doctor had been aware of this premonition and was watching him carefully. And, um, and there's, Maddie was so delirious the last five days before March 30th that he couldn't even know it was March 30th. And on March 30th, um, his blood sugar went up to something like 800 and he literally totally, when they got him to open his eyes, he said, it's dark. It's dark, I can't see. And he went into a coma. And they said he's not gonna survive the night. And it was March 30th. Oh, and they had a priest come in and anoint him, Father Dixon. Um, and Maddie was completely unresponsive, even to pain. And when Father Dixon anointed him, um, when he got to the end of the anointing and the prayers, he said, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of, and he stopped and started crying. And I looked up thinking, oh my gosh, Maddie's just died, but I don't hear any alarms. Mm -hmm. And Maddie is making the sign of the cross. He's unresponsive to pain and he's making the sign of the cross with all these tubes coming out of him. Um, I will tell you as a mom, when midnight hit March 30th into 31st, I cried with relief because I thought he didn't die on March 30th. He's got more time. Um, and I felt better, even though the doctor said he's not going to survive. I knew he was. But then on his 13th birthday, um, a day he should have been celebrating, what he wanted was to become a teenager. And on a day that he's simultaneously celebrating with Marilyn Krabs and chocolate ice cream cake, he's also struggling emotionally. And, um, and he said, this is my last birthday. And he didn't die until June 22nd the next year. And I, but I said, how do you know this is your last birthday? We've been through this before. And he said, because God told me I've done a good job. He, there's no more messages. I've shaped the messages. I'm def there's nothing more for me to do. I, I finished what he gave me. Hmm. And now I have to live with the silence of God giving me strength. He said, God's here. God's with me. God's proud of me but he's asking nothing else of me but to finish these last bits. And he said, I'm done. Jenny, in the last few months, we have seen a real explosion, and it's a national, I mean, it's a national epidemic in suicides. We're seeing this among celebrities, you see it among sports figures. What would you say to people who feel hope is gone? There's no reason left to live. I can honestly say I've been there. Mm -hmm. I have, I've been there. Um, I have questioned why I could take a next breath. And I can reassure anybody 
that if you can get through this dark moment, there will be another moment where you realize why hope is real and that hope is real. And if you can't find that reason on your own, if you cannot connect to God, to prayer, to something inside of you, reach out to someone else. Allow someone else to give you hope. Allow someone else to be the reflection of God. Allow someone else to be your rope. When you get to the end of your rope, tie it to someone else's because life is worthy. And as bad as this moment feels, and I honestly, um, I, I don't know other people's pain. I will never say I've felt other people's pain, but I know the pain of loss and suffering. I know the pain of burying four children. I know the pain of watching my children die. I know the pain of fearing for my own life. I know the pain of um, failed families and, and marriages. I mean, I, I know pain. Um, I know what it's like to, to think there is no purpose. But I promise you there's always purpose. We're just not seeing it because of pain move through the pain, the pain will eventually go away. It's like, it's like any kind of injury. It doesn't always hurt this bad. It may never ever go away, but it doesn't always hurt this bad. And there will be at least happiness, if not joy, in some future moment, it will be okay. Mm. Ask somebody else to help you and be, be there for you. Mm. Actually, you're giving someone else a gift when you allow them to step in and, and be a source of hope for you. And that's what Maddie wanted to do. It's interesting that you brought that up because that was one of the, when Maddie would be on TV, when Maddie's books would be published, people would reach out, um, all kinds of people, children, adults, people with disabilities, people without disabilities, people of all faiths and nationalities. But there was a significant percentage of people that reached out to him who were suffering, homeless, and suicidal. Mm. People that would say, you've changed my mind. I don't want to die. I don't know why I want to live, but I don't want to die. Life is worthy. I'm, I'm going to be a source of hope for someone else. Because when you can't figure out why hope is real for you, if you try to be hope for someone else, suddenly you feel the hope again. And that's what Maddie would, would try to help people do is mm -hmm. what can you do for someone else? How can you shift the focus of your pain so that it's got a different meaning? Right. Um, but there were countless people, um, people on death row, people who were suicidal, people who were angry and given up on, on God and on other people in the world who would reach out um, either to say you've inspired me or to ask Maddie for advice um, on how to take that next breath, that next step into that next moment. For more information on Maddie Stepanek's life and the cause for sainthood, visit maddieonline.com.